Thank you, Scott. Um, can I do a sound check? Can the folks in the Zendo hear me? Yeah. Okay. And I saw a few thumbs up from from Zoom land, the Zoom do. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Scott. Um, I'll give a little bit more of an introduction. So my name is Carolyn Seaburn. My pronouns are she and her. I'm coming to you from the city of Ottawa, um, from Mountain Moon Zonga of Ottawa, which is also the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And uh, I don't know if you folks can see this little pin that I am wearing. Um, it's an orange shirt. I'm wearing it today because uh, here in Canada, in just over a week, we will be marking the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This pin was given to me by an Anishinaabe elder, and it represents the thousands of Indigenous children who were sent to residential schools and returned home broken or not at all. Today, I am going to talk about Mumonkan case number three, Gute's one finger. This case is also found in the Hekigon Roku, case 19, and in the Shoyoroku case 84. There are not very many koans that show up in all three of these major books of koans. And so that gives you an indication of just how important this koan is. Before I go any further though, Uh, I'm going to give a trigger warning within this culture, this time and place, I feel it is necessary for me to give a trigger warning for two reasons. This koan contains a scene of violence and as someone who is privileged not to have experienced significant violence in my life, I cannot speak to whether any of you should take care and perhaps not go further. This is your decision. But it's also a trigger of a different kind. What I can tell you is that even the most advanced and adept teacher cannot tell you what might trigger Kensho in a student or themselves. But as we shall see in this case, sometimes a very advanced and adept teacher does know when a trigger of some kind is called for. I will start by reading the koan. Mumonkon, case three, Gute's one finger. Whenever he was asked about Zen, Master Gute simply stuck up one finger. He had a boy attendant whom a visitor asked, what kind of teaching does your master give? The boy held up one finger too. 
Hearing of this, Gute cut off the boy's finger with a knife. As the boy ran away screaming with pain, Gute called to him. When the boy turned his head, Gute stuck up one finger. The boy was suddenly enlightened. When Gute was about to die, he said to the assembled monks, I received this one finger Zen from Tenru. I've used it all my life, but have not exhausted it. And as with all the cases in the Mumonkong, there is a verse. Old Tenru made a fool of Gute, cut the boy with a sharp blade. The mountain deity, Kore, raised his hand, and lo, without effort, great Mount Ka, with its many ridges, was split in two. So, what do we know about Gute? His actual name was Master Osho. Um, but he was often called Gute in a reference to one of his favorite sutras. And he was a very early Chinese monk. His master was Tenru, whose master in turn was Taibai, who was a successor of Basso. Um, some of those names might be familiar to some of you, some not. Um, neither Tenru nor Gute's exact dates are known, but Taibai was born 752 and died 839. So Gute likely lived in the 800s and therefore was a contemporary of Rinzai, who most of you have probably heard of. He was a Buddhist priest. Um, I gather originally not a Zen practitioner, but a Buddhist priest. He took diligent care of his temple duties. And one day he was seated in his room and a nun, Jisei, came to him. She walked around him three times, but did not take off her hat or bow, which was the custom at the time. Instead, she said to him, if you can say a word that satisfies me, I will take off my bamboo hat and make a bow. This is a very direct challenge. And Gute was not able to say a word. He was tongue-tied. The nun challenged him three times and still he could not respond. And by the end of their discussion, when he was, when she was preparing to leave, it was getting late. Gute invited her to stay at the temple for the night as it was already dark. And she said to him, if you say something, I'll stay. But again, he was speechless and she left. Now, you can imagine how this made Gute feel. He was very ashamed of himself and he decided that he needed to find a good Zen master. That night, he dreamt that an important master would arrive in the next few days and teach him. And the very next day, Tenru arrived. Gute greeted him with great respect and told him the whole story. 
Gute's response was to hold up a finger. And at that moment, sorry, Tenru's response was to hold up a finger. And at that moment, Gute experienced deep enlightenment. Now, It kind of sounds absurd. You might think, in fact, that this, this practice of holding up a finger is rather simple minded. It is, and that's what's important about it. It's very simple minded. It's very simple. It's also this koan is one of the most powerful Koans, I think because of that simplicity. Uh, the abbot of Sambo Zen, around Roshi, has said that he considers this koan as powerful as Mu to truly deepen one's experience, although perhaps as a tool as a tool, Mu is, is perhaps more effective um, and easier to use. But I will say for myself in preparing for this Teisho, I found it very, very effective. And perhaps that's because um, tend to think of myself, I tend to call myself kinesthetically oriented, touch action oriented rather than sight or sound oriented. And so this sensation of holding up the finger is very powerful for me. But we're all different. And maybe that's why we have so many koans. Gute used this one finger to answer every question he was asked. He said he had never exhausted it. So how is it that this one finger can answer all of our deepest questions? Who am I? What is the nature of reality? What does it mean to be alive? or dead? Do I matter? Actually, this one finger not only answers all those questions, it is the answer to those questions. Um, and maybe this is a subtle point. But you could say, I answer your questions by going blah, 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 blah. But that's not the same thing as saying, I am the answer. And it's in that sense that this one finger is the answer. Both senses, actually. It's a, it's a subtle point, but however much I may talk, there's a limit to how clear I can be. There's nothing clear. This one finger is 
utter clarity, radiant, lustrous, whether it is tiny, like the finger of an infant, calloused or gnarled, perhaps arthritic, or even cut off and lying bloody on the table. This is it. Yamada Koan Roshi, a previous abbot of Sambozen, wrote about this koan, and I quote, on a single finger are revealed a hundred thousand dharma gates and endless states. In other words, because it exhausts the entire universe, the infinitely small is the same as the infinitely large. It's a pretty powerful statement. I might have worded it a little differently, and perhaps that's a problem of translation. But where it says, on this finger, really it's the finger itself. The finger itself is each dharma gate. And it also reveals them. It reveals them because it's right here, clearly in front of us, wherever you may be, you always carry it with you. Even if you're born without fingers, still you carry it with you. Now, most of us, when we first encounter this koan, we're drawn to the boy's story. Yet the boy's story is not really the point of the koan. It's rarely addressed in Teisho. We don't even know his name. And to be frank, it's uncomfortable to contemplate a trusted teacher cutting off a child's finger. It's easier to shy away from talking about it. Now, I do not presume to judge either the master, Gute, or the culture within which this event took place. I wasn't there. But there are two elements about this part of the koan that I'd like us to look at. The first is about the nature of the turning word or trigger. And if you recall in the backstory, the nun Jise was looking for that turning word, that trigger. There are many, many koans that show us how a phrase, image, a sensation, an act can trigger enlightenment. Shiluan Zenji in Mount Reun was enlightened by the sight of peach blossoms in the distance. Eno, the sixth patriarch, was enlightened by hearing part of the Heart Sutra. Tosu Zenji was enlightened by having his master cover his mouth. My own first Kensho was triggered by a sudden sensation of fear. Here, the boy is triggered by Gute raising his finger. And I imagine by the boy's own impulse 
to raise his now missing finger in response. It's a tactile trigger. How many of you at some point already have been drawn to raise your finger and look at it? And as I said earlier, no one can predict what will trigger Kensho. It's like a super saturated solution in chemistry. Once the solution is in the right state, just about anything can trigger, trigger a crystallization. But if it's not quite ready, it's no use at all. The second point is the delicate one. One could ask, why did Gute cut off the boy's finger? And I don't know the answer to that question. What we do know is the boy was Gute's attendant. He would have spent quite a lot of time with him, observing whenever Gute was asked a question and seeing him raise his finger. A visitor arrived and asked the boy a question about Gute's finger. And he responded by raising a finger. It seems like a very natural response. But is it the response of someone imitating their master? Or is it the response of someone earnestly trying to experience what their master sees? The point here is that at that time, the boy had not yet truly seen his master's finger. And evidently, Gute saw there a supersaturated solution. You see, the boy was trying to express something without first having seen it. How is it that Tenru or Gute could express the entire matter just so, but the boy could not? We all work very hard to try and figure out how to express what our teacher's looking for in the dope sun room, to try and put into our own words what we've heard or read so that it sounds convincing, to express somehow whatever, however vaguely, we see something. But if you're completely gone, if you truly see, however you express it, it is the whole matter. And even something as simple as this it expresses itself naturally. So what did the boy realize? You might expect that the answer to this question involves the boy gaining some understanding that as you hold up this finger, you too might gain some understanding. Actually, the finger understands long before your conscious mind. 
in this in this physical practice, I may say this, and you may understand what I mean by a physical practice, but even by thinking it, you've missed the point. This finger is not expressing an answer. It's the whole thing. It doesn't really underman under doesn't really matter if you understand consciously. The practice is learning to hear the preaching of this one finger. And I don't know if you can get what I'm trying, trying to say here, but maybe your finger gets it. Let it lead you because it knows. Somehow this boy got it, even though his finger was now cut off. This finger is the entire universe. It's mountains, rivers, pain, the bell. Can you hear the bell ringing? <laughs> and yet, it's also completely empty. And still it feels the whole universe. So tell me, which one of these fills the whole universe? Can you answer that in the Doksan room? Can you answer who is it that's holding up this finger? If you can see whose finger this is, then you will understand the power of this koan. When I first did this koan with my teacher 25 years ago, I thought Gute was stuck, that he was very constrained by following this one practice, that he was attached to this one finger. If you think about it, he was attached to this one finger. It's pretty marvelous, actually. I just say this carefully. I don't want you to misunderstand. But in the act of cutting off the boy's finger, I'm not saying that's marvelous, but in the act of doing so, he's presenting a very powerful demonstration of letting go. He's at once cutting off the boy's delusions, my delusions, his own delusions. It is honestly barbaric and cruel, and I cannot condone his methods, but it is powerfully clear. And yet that action, that clarity, pales in comparison to truly seeing and experiencing this one finger. Whole of existence, each one of the myriad dharmas right here, the boy, Gute, the mountain, the computer screen, each one of you, the shudder of visualizing that cut off finger right here, Gute's finger right here, your finger, you hold the entirety of 
of the known universe on the tip of your finger. How awesome is that? The whole, each one, and nothing at all. You might think I just said three different things. You might wonder which is right, which is deeper. They're just three different ways of saying the same thing. This finger is preaching to you continuously. Can you hear it? Can you see it? Can you touch it? Can you move it? And then the verse. Old Tenru made a fool of Gute who cut the boy with a sharp blade. The mountain deity Kore raised his hand and lo, without effort, great Mount Ka with its many ridges was split in two. How did Tenru make a fool of Gute? One could say that by triggering his enlightenment, he became a fool. But also, the idea of enlightenment is a fool's idea. Doesn't he know he's got nothing to gain? And yet also, in order to see that, one must become a fool. One must let go of all of those ideas and concepts that are in our way. And then there's the mountain deity Kore. So this is a, a reference to an old Chinese uh, story. I don't know if myth is the right word. That the mountain deity split this great Mount Ka so that the Yellow River could pass through, leading to several mountains. How does this, how does this relate to the koan? This finger cracked Gute wide open. And the whole universe poured through. What about you? It's going to crack you wide open. There's no need for a knife. You already have everything that this one finger can teach you. It's nothing to gain. It's just a matter of seeing. What power does it hold for you? Thank you. I had had one one question, at least, and that was um, you, you you mentioned in the beginning that uh, you had been working with this finger in preparation for the Tay Show. I was just kind of curious if you could share any more about that with us, about your working with it. Ah, oh, um, what can I say? 
I've, I've not done a lot of taste shows, but one thing that I've learned is that whenever I'm preparing a taste show, whatever koan I'm working on is my favorite. <laughs> um, but I really do feel blessed to have spent the time with this koan because I don't think I had ever seen it quite, quite so clearly before. And um, yeah, I, I, I realize that it, it kind of resonates a little bit with a very powerful experience I had a number of years ago, which was also um, a touch experience. And I think, I think for me, that, that quality of a touching of contact with something, it's, it's like, it's like electric current. I, I can't describe it any, any more than that, but it just really, um, it made me um, even more aware than I had been before the extent to which wisdom resides not just in here. Thank you. Hello, Carolyn, this is Bill. Thank you for that talk so much. Um, uh, Gute said that in all of his life, he's never exhausted that one finger Zen. Mm -hmm. And um, we just chanted the four great vows and delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. So, What's the relation between Gute's finger, inexhaustible, and delusions that are inexhaustible? Oh, wow. <laughs> ah, thank you, Bill, for that question. Um, What can I say? I guess, you know, human beings have a really hard time grasping the infinite, right? The inexhaustible, yeah. the, the magnitude of this marvelous existence that we inhabit. And one of the things one learns in the practice of Zen is that wonders are inexhaustible. Um, and in a sense, the delusions, the inexhaustible delusions are our helpers because 
they by by becoming aware of them by breaking through them it opens the door to another wonder so i think actually there's a there's a very very intimate relationship between those two types of inexhaustible thank you for that question yeah thank you carolyn for that answer um folks on zoom if you if you don't want to put your hand up or unmute feel free to put questions in the chat as well Well, perhaps um, we're at a stopping place then. And uh, gosh, we so appreciate your your sharing your your insights and and, and your practice and your, your teaching with us tonight, Carol. And um, it's just um, a joy and a blessing. And uh, every time you come here, we we get so much. So thank you. I see actually a, a question oh, just okay. oh, good, good. in the chat. Oh, there's um, 11 of them. I, I kind of wonder, you know, this Colin is so much about not speaking that maybe it's hard for people to put their thoughts into words. How is this Colin like the one you presented last time? Ooh, well, I have to, how do you think it is? <laughs> and and I'm not, I'm not being cute about that um, because, um, I know, what did I present last time? I don't remember. Uh, you know, they're all expressing the same world. Yakijo and the fox. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I know which koan it was, but what, what did I say about it? Um, You know, they're both about getting beyond the intellectual, but you know, every koan, every koan is. So I'm sorry, I can't, maybe, maybe uh, what makes them, well, I don't know if it's the, ta if it's the koans or the te shows, um, probably there's, there's themes that keep coming to me. That... I just, would it be possible, plausible that the, the mistake um, element of Piakajo, the wild fox, um, uh, of making two was similar to what the boy was doing, um, um, making a mistake by dividing, you know, he, he himself was that, uh, that um, Gute was seeing that he wasn't he didn't understand that not to um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, I yeah i i don't know that i would say that the boy made a mistake yeah i, I think it's really really important not to interpret the koan as Gute cut off his finger because he did something wrong. Um, it, it, because if that's what happened, then then this should not be a koan and and we don't, you know, it, it's it's not a story that, that teaches us anything. Um, So, you know, I think it's clear from the material we're given that the boy was not yet enlightened, 
when he gave his answer, but that doesn't mean that he made a mistake. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just recalling what you said about uh, he saw, Gute saw uh, a thoroughly saturated student. That's right. And he That's right. triggered his um, the boy's enlightenment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank and I, I think I think that's I don't know if I should say this. I think that's really important because we all have the experience, any of you who are doing Doksan have the experience of presenting something to the teacher and being told wrong, 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 over and over again, wrong, 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 try again. But that experience of presenting something which elicits that wrong from the teacher, it's not a mistake, it's part of the process. It's an important part of the process. I, I remember, um, and I, I know I've heard this before, both from Rowan Roshi and, and from others, but at the, the Kenshikai this past summer, Rowan Roshi was talking about um, when he was studying with Yastani Roshi, his own teacher. Um, and over several years, going to Doksan at every opportunity to say, I don't know the answer. And the importance of doing that over and over and over again, just to walk in and say, no, I don't get it yet. That's part of the practice. Thank you. Any other questions? Going once, <laughs> going twice. <laughs> uh, thank you all. I love uh, talking to you folks.